Let's pray together. We thank you, Lord God Almighty, for this beautiful opportunity you've given us to be in your presence. We avail ourselves to you, to the Holy Spirit, to speak to us, to rebuke us, to correct us, to instruct us, and inspire us in righteousness for the glory of your name. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please take your seats. Thank you, Provost. It's a beautiful day God has given us. As we continue with our theme for the year, Seeking God's Kingdom. Seeking God's Kingdom. And today our focus is spiritual disciplines. I want to take us back just a bit. I think it's something we should do as the year goes on to keep reminding ourselves what the Kingdom of God is all about. In Romans 14, 17, Paul writing to the Christians in Rome defined it for them and said the kingdom of God is all about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so thinking about it, righteousness from the Old Testament all the way to the New Testament, God has always demanded it of his people. He told Israel, be ye holy. For I, the Lord your God, I am holy. Thinking about peace, isn't our Lord Jesus Christ the Prince of Peace? There's no peace without Christ. Whether internal peace for you as an individual or peace in our communities, as long as we keep the Prince of Peace out, there's no peace. This is about the kingdom of God. Joy in the Holy Spirit. Our Lord Jesus said, promised in John 14, that when he goes, he will send the counselor, the comforter, the helper to come and help us. We find joy in him. He empowers us. You go back to the Old Testament, in Zechariah, you find the words to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by the Holy Spirit. It is he who enables us to do and to become what God wants us to be. That is the kingdom of God. Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Spirit. And so as we get deeper into 2019, taking this as our theme, and having a scriptural understanding of the kingdom of God, the big question is, are you interested? Are you interested in the kingdom of God? You may have seen this with the real estate agents, they go, they advertise, they tell you they have a big chamber they are selling somewhere or a house. They put it on TV. They send brochures all around. Finally, they tell you, come, we take you there. And when you look at it, they ask you, are you interested? This is the question we need to ask ourselves. It is not irrelevant. It is possible for us to be coming to God's house and the kingdom of God is not part of the agenda of our lives. Some come to church, but righteous living is not something they believe in. They don't even think it is possible. Some come to church, but they are not lovers of peace. If you follow them, even in their family circles, in their neighborhoods, in their communities, they are warmongers. But they come to church. Some come to church, but the Holy Spirit has no place in their lives. They learn their lives by their own power and might. But from here we shall make an assumption that all of us are pursuers of the kingdom of God. And if that be the case, we need some equipping. We need some equipping so as to effectively pursue and apprehend the kingdom of God for ourselves. This is where the spiritual disciplines come in. The equipping that we need so that we can apprehend the kingdom of God for ourselves. The change needed is inward. It is not out here. The change needed for us to know the kingdom of God, to experience the kingdom of God is inward. God himself laments in Jeremiah 17, talking about the heart of man. And he says the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? And then he says, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind. And therefore our only hope 
in getting the right change within us is by letting God work within us so that he can change us. From our reading in 2 Timothy, Paul tells Timothy, be diligent to present yourself as one approved, one who correctly handles the word of God. He's telling him it's not enough to be in that environment of the sanctuary and all that. Take your time and seek God and his instructions so that you'll be one approved. God will be able to change you from within. In Philippians 2, 12, Paul writes to the Philippians, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. There is God's part and there is my part. God knows his part. The spiritual disciplines are about my part. The spiritual disciplines allow or enable me to place myself before God so that he can change me. All the changes that are needed with me, as I've mentioned, are within. But I have to avail myself to God. I have to avail myself to the working of the Holy Spirit for him to change me. He does not force his way in. I will talk about three of them today. The list is endless. But I want to talk about meditation, simplicity, and solitude. Meditation, simplicity, and solitude. They have interesting names, and you're free to modify them for yourself. But starting with meditation, for the Christian, meditation means listening to God's word, reflecting on God's word, thinking about the actions of our God, the intentions of our God, remembering his deeds in your life, and in the lives of others. We do that as we read his word, as we meditate on his word. We are able to know him, who he is, how he has acted in the past, what he demands of us. That is what meditation for the Christian means. It's all centered on God and what he stands for. In meditation, we, we know how God has revealed himself. If we are to do this, we need to be at ease with God. And I would want you to ask yourself at this point, if you found yourself in a, in a room somewhere, a closed room, alone with God for three solid hours, would you be comfortable? Alone with God for three hours. Or would you feel uneasy because you are in the company of a stranger? Remember, you are preparing to spend eternity with him. So we might as well get to know him, unless you want to spend eternity with the other guy. The psalmist in Psalms 84 verse 10 says, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. He's expressing his desire, his joy to be in God's presence. All that other time does not make sense to him. And remember for the psalmist, in the days of, that they were writing, for them spending time with God meant going physically to the temple, making a journey. That is, that's why in Psalms we have the groups of uh, pilgrim psalms, that they would sing, they would recite them as they went to the temple. For them, it was a geographical occasion. But for now, in the New Testament time, we know Emmanuel, God with us. Anywhere, anytime, God is available. You can pull out your Bible, digital or analog, and look at his word and remember and get to know what he is telling you. The challenge is to each one of us. Are we doing it? Remember God telling Joshua in Joshua 1.8, do not let this book of the Lord depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then your way will be prosperous and successful. The content of our meditation is not mystical. The content of our meditation is the word of God, God's revelation of himself to us. 
And at this point, we need to sanitize the word meditation. Because we have everything else out there being called meditation, we have transcendental meditation, we have yoga, we have all those things which have come from the Eastern religions, Hinduism and the rest. And I want to mention it here, brethren, don't go through this life without ever having had it. It doesn't matter whether your employer says in a time of team building and all that, that yoga is good, it relaxes you, transcendental meditation is a way of doing what? That stuff is devilish. It has its roots in those Eastern religions, in Hinduism and the rest. It is not neutral. It is not harmless. I know we are all in modern society. It's all over in books and in the media. But hear it from the pulpit that it is evil. Do not expose yourself to it. When we talk about meditation, that is not what we are talking about. You get in touch with it, chances are that you spend the rest of your life in deliverance meetings, trying to chase out the demons you invited. Let's avoid that. But back to our meditation. Meditating on the word of God is demanding. It is a discipline. In Psalm 119, verse 97, the psalmist again brings out the sweetness and he says, Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Get the two ends of it. It's a discipline. You've got to decide to be there. But you've got to aim to get to where the psalmist is. Where he says, I love your law. I'd rather spend a whole day thinking about it. It is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. There's a sweetness the psalmist finds in the word of God. And if it is not sweet to me, then there is something else that is sweet to me, and I need to find it out and deal with it. Is it sweet to you? The whole business of taking time to meditate on the word of God is taxing. That's why we are calling it a discipline. Sometimes we find a way around it. And it has been said that the greatest com competition of devotion to Jesus is service for him. The greatest competition for devotion to Jesus is service for him. And so here I'm talking to myself and to all who are involved in church work one way or the other. Christian work can be a way of avoiding the deep, meaningful interaction with God. It is important for us to serve God, and we need to do it. And you cannot stop me from preaching the gospel, from serving God. But I need to find out the reason why I'm doing it. It should never be a way of compensating for what should have been time spent with God. If that is the case, and if you end up serving God as a way of compensating for the time you should have spent with him, what happens in the long run? is that you get inoculated, you get vaccinated against the real encounter with God. You get small doses of encountering God, small harmless doses of encountering God, which eventually vaccinate you against the real encounter with God. The end risk is that you join the group Jesus talked about in Matthew 7, where he said, they will be saying we did miracles in your name. And Jesus will be saying, I never knew you. They will be saying, we cast out demons in your name. And Jesus will be saying, I don't remember seeing you anywhere. Because there was no fellowship. There was no interaction with him. Each one of us needs a skirmish with God, a violent encounter with God, an, an encounter where you wrestle with God. Remember what Jacob did in Genesis, Genesis 32, where he wrestled with God, where he told God, I'm not leaving you until you bless me. He wrestled until he was left limping, but blessed eternally. Each of us needs a skirmish with God. A time when God gets a chance to lay his finger on something in your life, in cold blood, and he says, we have to get rid of this. And the choice is yours. Either henceforth you will walk with him 
or you will turn to the other guy. Each of us needs a skirmish with God, an encounter like Paul had on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. So terrifying, he was left blind, but a new creation. He changed the direction, and from then henceforth, he was a child of God. In that encounter, God changes us, and we make a choice. In that encounter, we become a new creation. And let me remind us that in Revelation 3.20, those words that we know very well, I stand at the door and knock, they were originally written to believers, to a church. They were not written to non-believers. They were written to a church. It's possible to be in God's house, and he still says, I'm knocking. Can you allow me in? I want a fellowship with you. But you're busy doing church. The second is simplicity. Simplicity finds its root in Matthew chapter 6 from verse 19 where Jesus said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where more than rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where more than rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Here we are talking material and money and that kind of stuff. Another way of uh, calling simplicity would be what, what Paul calls it in 1 Timothy 6, 6, godliness with contentment. That is simplicity. Those treasures which Jesus mentions in Matthew 6, which are accepted in God's warehouse in heaven, they are the kind apprehended in meditation. They are the kind that we get for ourselves because we were spending time looking at God's word and hearing him speak. And his word was cleaning us up. As again Paul writes, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. It was changing us. Special treasures which God does not give to the casual observer, but to the one who is willing to take time with him. They are the kind many have died for over the years whenever the Christian faith has been under persecution. They are for the blessed ones mentioned in Psalm 84. Psalm 84, verse 5, the psalmist says, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. The pilgrims, the psalmist is talking about here, when you come across them, they look poor by worldly terms. You may never know how rich they are unless you walk with them. They never call the media to announce their latest acquisitions, and their treasures are not listed in the stock exchange. They procure their treasures in the quiet times with God. They procure their treasures in times of meditation, seeking to know the mind of God. And once they get those treasures, they wire them to the warehouse in heaven, and they keep going on their journey, because that is what matters to them. Those treasures are not in their backpacks. If a thief tried to check in their handbags, they will find things that are not of value, because their treasures are in the warehouse in heaven. But they are wealthy. The psalmist continues to talk about them. Psalm 84, verse 6. As they pass through the valley of Baca, Baca is a place of tears. In our terms today, we can call it the challenges of life. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. In other words, they are able to rejoice in God always, regardless of the circumstances surrounding them, because of the treasures that they carry. In verse 7, the psalmist says, they go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Guaranteed that they will complete their race running. Are you one of them? Am I one of them? We need to ask ourselves. To be able to focus on the heavenly treasures properly, we need to have some tough policies concerning the other treasures so that they do not stand in our way. 
And I want to borrow a bit from Richard Foster. He has a beautiful book titled Celebration of Discipline. And he suggests a number of these policies. I'll mention a few. One, talking about material things, he says, buy things for their usefulness rather than their status. In other words, are you finding your worth in God's love for you or in what you own? That is a question which only the individual can answer. Are you finding your worth in the possessions you have or in God's love for you? Number two, he says, reject anything that is producing an addiction in you. From coke to coffee, from TV, internet, social media. Refuse to be a slave to anything but God himself. Very personal decisions. And the third one, he says, develop a habit of giving things away. Many, Christi many Christians have actually discovered that giving, generally giving, pushes back the spirit of greed and gratitude which is inherent in us. It's always a blessing to give. May we teach ourselves to give. Learn to enjoy things without owning them. He says here, enjoy the beach without feeling you have to buy or grab a plot there. We need to allow God to remain the, the landlord of the earth. Psalms 24 verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And Kenyans, we know that this is a big challenge for us. Those who are older may remember a number of years back as we were picking the momentum for corruption and grabbing. There was a time when it looked like the whole city was going. And I remember one cartoonist drawing some picture in the Daily Nation some decades back. And the caption read, Somaya buys thicker road. It was a message to Kenyans that some things shouldn't belong to you. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Number five, he says, obey what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 37. Simply let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. We Christians should lead in straightforward, simple communication. You know, not the kind of thing you hear someone say and you need an astrologer to decipher what they were saying. Because the words are so hidden, they are so ambiguous, intentionally. We should be lovers of the truth. That is simplicity. Richard Foster's list is much longer, but each one of us needs to find in the word of God personal guidance towards the simple life of a pilgrim so that we can focus on the treasures laid in heaven. Finally, we talk about solitude. We need to differentiate between a state of solitude and being lonely. Elizabeth Elliot, who many of you may know from her books, like Through Gates of Splendor and others, she became a widow twice. Each time she wrestled with God about the resultant loneliness. Finally, she wrote a book titled Loneliness. And in it are pearls for those who desire a closer walk with God. One of the things she learned from her experience was that, was that she could turn her loneliness into solitude. She could turn her loneliness into solitude and turn the solitude into prayer. And that's something each one of us can do. If for whatever reason circumstances are making you lonely, turn it into solitude, a time with God. A time to be with God. A time where God is your agenda and you find new meaning. She also learned that loneliness can be a form of selfishness even when we are in challenging circumstances. Because she says one can reject friendship, even friendship from God, because it's offered in terms different from what you wanted. But when we listen to him in times of loneliness, we can convert it to solitude, spending time with him. Remember our earlier question on having three hours with God alone. If we are able to do that and to be still enough, 
still enough for a dove to rest on your shoulder, still enough for the Holy Spirit to speak, then our lonely moments become times of solitude. No agenda, but a focus on God. Foster says that if we possess that gift of solitude, we do not fear to be alone. We also don't fear to be with many people because they don't control us. We have a portable sanctuary in ourselves. Under whatever circumstances, our relationship with God is vibrant. And we could be quiet somewhere, enjoying God's presence. The major difference between solitude and meditation is that in solitude, we go without an agenda. We don't go to study, as we said in meditation. We avail ourselves to God. And again, I want to differentiate this with the Eastern mysticism. We go to someone. We don't go to the universe. I am not a child of the universe. I am a child of God. We go to God. And we tell him, I come. Master, speak. Thy servant heareth. And he is faithful. He does it. And so as I wind up, ask yourself, is the kingdom of God, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, a part of the agenda of your life? Are you interested? And if you are interested, are you on this journey of apprehending it for yourself, thinking about meditation? Would you say with the psalmist, oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Have you had your encounter with God where he put his finger on the issues in your life that he wants you to drop? Remember simplicity. Travel light. Allow God to remain the landlord of the world. And finally, solitude. Have you cultivated a portable sanctuary in yourself that whether alone or in a noisy environment, you are with God. You can hear him speak. He can whisper to you. He can trust your ear. Let's pray together. Thank you, our Lord and our God, for your love for each one of us. Thank you because you don't call us into nothingness. You call us to yourself. You who sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us. I pray for each one of us this day that in us may be found a hunger for you that we would say with the psalmist we want to know you more. To spend time meditating on your word. To spend time seeking your face. To ultimately be found in your kingdom because our treasures are laid up there. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May God bless you.